Today we have with us Liz Peterson, a advanced energy healer. She and I discuss children with gifts, a sort of sixth sense, and how to encourage them to deal with these heightened sensitivities, embrace these awarenesses, and to build on them. We talk about empaths and how they could protect themselves and shield themselves from outside energies, and how disease or ailments, they often show up in our energy field that then manifests in our body. We hit on so many other topics as well. So I hope you'll join us with this interesting discussion. And as always, um, hit that like button and hit the subscribe. And thank you so much. Because the physical body really holds on to trauma if you don't know how to release it, right? And who's taught, you know, going through grade school or by our parents to release our trauma, right? Nobody. So it all gets stuck in our body and then can start mutating into different ailments like aches and pains or illnesses. Business owners like CEOs, I think are very intuitive because they know what to say and what to do and when to do it, right? right. So if you own these skills, it's not just about you know, being woo woo or being psychic, it's about living your best life and using it as a skill. So, hey. Hi. Nice to, to see you. you. Good to see you too. So you have a practice. What, how many different modalities do you, do you study or work with these days? Oh my gosh, I may have lost track. <laughs> okay. So um, in my early 20s, I was living in Virginia and I started massage school. And my teacher who taught the Swedish massage portion of um, the massage program at Baltimore School of Massage also did um, polarity therapy and she also did shamanism. So I ended off actually breaking off of Baltimore School of Massage and during doing her work instead. So I did her training and got certified in polarity therapy and then did a couple classes in shamanism. That was kind of opening up the door for that aspect of my life, which I had always loved, you know, always loved hearing about power animals and drum circles and soul retrievals and that sort of thing and had worked with a couple shamans before. So that was really fun. After leaving Maryland, I moved to Washington and found a program because of anxiety and panic attacks called um, Northwest School of Healing. And she had gone to Barbara Brennan's school in New York for four year program, which was quite involved with um, doing her program and therapy on the side and a couple other things. So she brought that work at, with Barbara Brennan's permission to Washington. So I was able to do her four year program and she incorporated Reiki master. So each year we got up leveled in Reiki. Um, we nice. got taught craniosacral work and all of the advanced um, energy work modalities that Barbara Brennan did and that my teacher did at the time. Um, shamanism. Mm -hmm. You know, I hear that, that word thrown around quite a bit, but I don't really have a good understanding of what, what that means to be practicing shaman, shamanism or um, to be a shaman? Hmm. To be a shaman is to be a seer. Okay. So years ago, back when the tribes were existent and in other countries where tribes are still existent, they take the person in the tribe who has the gifts, who has the psychic gifts, who is a seer, and they train them to be the medicine people in the tribe. Um, there's a lot of talk these days about cultural appropriation around shamanism. So I try not to step on any toes, so to speak, um, around my practice. And my practice is um, using clearing techniques and um, the seeing part of myself in my practice and not really appropriating all of those um, tools that you would practice in those cultures. So I had written down... I guess when we talked last time, you had mentioned about a car accident that you were in a while back. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that kind of catapulted your, uh, some of the, the, the things that you're delving into these days. Mm -hmm. It did. It really did. So for me, senior year, I was sewing and looking at fashion design and even did my senior, um, what is it called? Like the senior project or? Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. So I did my senior project around fashion design, right? Which turns out was my mother's dream, right? So living my mother's dream. So I go out to Fair San enough. Diego and I'm going to fashion design school and I'm like, oh, I like this, but there's aspects that I don't. And, you know, working in retail and that sort of thing and ended up getting in a car accident, a really bad car accident. I was actually um, in and out of consciousness for a couple of days Thank goodness wow. my sister, my older sister, Connie is an RN. So she was able to bring me home from the hospital and kind of caretake me, but it completely changed my path. So, you know, going through really oh. rehabilitation and really looking at what I had been doing, I decided that really wasn't my dream. Right. And they kind of left me um, identity less, really. Like I lost right. my identity, like who I was I going to be? right? I had this plan. So I moved home, ended up uh, moving to Virginia with friends and um, kind of just trying to find myself. Like, who was I if I, you know, wasn't the person from Cambridge or the person who went to school in California or um, the fashion designer, right? So I started getting into um, my health. So you're the shaman. A lot. (laughs) That's that's right. (laughs) Yeah. My, um, my gifts started coming back online, you know, that I used to have in childhood that I had shut down a little bit, not totally. Um, so that was starting to come online. Um, I had a roommate tell me that, um, that I'd be really good at massage therapy because I used to rub his shoulders after work. We were, um, he was waiter, waitress, I was waitress. So, um, so he's like, wow, you have really strong hands. Have you ever thought about being a massage therapist? So that was kind of one of those jumping off points for me to that opened up a door into, you know, sort of like back into the spirit realm and back into, you know, those um, alternative healing modalities really right. just opened up the door for me from there. Yeah. That's wonderful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For me, it was um, divorce and the real estate downfall of, of like 10 years ago um everything was just completely falling apart and i was like holy you know what am i supposed to do i had that you know, happen to me again in 2017 yeah same wow. situation divorce complete and total life change and just mm-hmm. catapulted me back into um creating something more than um just my healing work that I had been doing for a couple of years on Vashon. Again, you know, the identity crisis, I think those can be initiations into, you know, not only personal growth, but a new start in life for sure. You know, those dark times can really catapult you forward. Yeah. I experienced the same thing. I don't think if that had happened, I'd be where I am or what I'm doing or doing what I'm doing right now. Right. Yeah, yeah. Same here. I wish those initiations weren't so dead gone. Uh, difficult <laughs> right you know. yes could not yeah. be like a nice little nudge in the right direction <laughs> i think if we were in utopia we'd just lay there and eat grapes and sip wine right that would be what we'd be doing we wouldn't be worried about personal growth or changing our lives or trying to help other people who have suffered the same things as us right, right. which is what we're seeing now i think globally like what's going on right now is a definite you know kick in the butt and spiritual awakening, personal growth opportunity for a lot of people because of all the darkness going on right now. I I absolutely agree with you. Yeah. I think you were telling me about your, your kids that they are also sensitive to energies. And so, and you know, I I know of a number of kids that are are sensitive to energies and they have like things like uh, attention deficit and, you know, a number of, number of things, Mm -hmm. but didn't know if if you have any experience treating that sort of thing and what you would recommend because I'd, I'd love to kind of get an idea of what mothers can do for their kids when they see you know what are some of those tools they can use to help correct some of those um, you know difficulties challenges sure yeah not only do I have sensitive kids I was a sensitive kid and I see it in my children you know, the shyness or being able to read a room or um, seeing spirit when very little. Um, So I think with my children, what I've done is given them information. So first letting them know it's okay and normal and not their imagination. You know, I remember one Mm. time my um, now 21 year old was in the bathtub. He was like two or three years old. 
And um, he goes, mommy, who's that guy standing in the hallway? And I'm like, well, I call him Bob, right? Because I can sense spirit back then I could sense now I'm coming more online where I'm starting to be able to see and communicate more, but I'm like, yeah, I call him Bob, you know, what do you see? Do you see um, something different than me? Do you want to describe him to me? I'm like, he's safe. He's not going to hurt us. He just likes to watch sometimes, but we can ask him to leave. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. So just being kind of gentle, accepting what they're experiencing. It's not their imagination, finding people who can help them if they need extra help. Um, reading material, uh, reading material yourself and then passing it along to them and then um, teaching them coping skills. So if they're uncomfortable in the room, you know, letting them know that they're uncomfortable, if they have social anxiety, letting them know it's okay. I know I was tagged with ADD in school because I just couldn't focus, right? I'm off in dream world all the time and not focused on the books like I'm supposed to be. Um, Yeah. So there's that too. I think um, children with sensitivities learn differently. I know I'm more of a hands-on learner and I have a couple kids who are more hands-on as well. And I have a couple kids who are super book smart. So, um, and sensitive, so it can be either or an and, you know, all of it. Um, And caretaking to their sensitive systems, like making sure they get movement outdoor time was super important to me and my kids, you know, I was always taking them outside, having them play outside and that sort of thing. Um, Healthy food, limiting media, because um, when you're sensitive, you're like a sponge. So you soak it all up. You like going to the mall and you're just excited and like exhausted when you get home. That's Mm -hmm. why as you've like absorbed all of the energy. I know when I was a kid and mom loved to shop, right? So we were always going to the mall. I would put myself in a bubble, like one focus, like whatever I was looking at would be my focus, you know? And um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that bubble? I have heard other people talk or mention it. Yeah. But if you're a kid and you're going into like a particular environment, Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can. You can put yourself in a bubble. So I didn't really know as a kid what I was doing. As an adult, I know I was putting myself like in a protective shield, a bubble, right? You can set an intention that you have this protective barrier between you and um, the outside world to kind of, you can either have things bounce off you, you can have things that come in like transmuted into something like if it's negative, have it transmuted into love and that sort of thing. It can be whatever you want it to be. You can picture it as a white bubble or um, this big shield that just bounces off negativity, right? It can be right. anything you want it to be. I think I naturally did it to escape. So I think it was a coping mechanism really of detaching myself from whatever was going on the outside, you know, the extra stimuli to be able to cope with it and just sort of enclose myself in a little cocoon for a while until I heard my name being called. (laughs) Gotcha. Yeah. It's amazing how, um, um, I mean, I've heard that story or that, that tool used, I guess, probably from the moment I got into all of this. Mm-hmm. If, if you find out you're an empath and you absorb other, other people's energy or, um, you know, emotions or the environment or whatever, mm-hmm. you imagine a protective shield around you. And I hear that time and time and time again. So there's really got to be something to it. And of course, when you're talking about energetics, it's really all about intention, right? So That's if you right. have the intention of stuff bouncing off of you or away from you so that it doesn't affect you as much, mm-hmm. If you're just conscious of um, other people's energy and you're, you're intentional about trying to keep it separate from yourselves, I mean, we, we can, I think we can all pretty much do that all day long. If you can envision, yeah. it, envision it as a bubble and get in the habit of making it a bubble. I, I even heard um, people put like a reflective shield on the outside of the bubble, like actually make it a large mirror to make it yes. more reflective. And the, the more detailed that you have that intention, the more effective it's going to be. I mean, thoughts are things. Right. But even when it comes to your imagination, um, it can help you out. Yes. And what if, what if your, your imagination became real? What if that really affected energy? And, of course, mm-hmm. science is absolutely proving that that is the case. So, yes. Um, if you think about it, you can actually walk around with a real imaginary bubble 
with a mirror on the outside of it, keeping other people's intentions out of your, um, your field. Yes. And, and it's extremely helpful during negative situations. And you can, yeah. you can make it anything you want, even reflect things back. And it's something that you can intend and then kind of let go of. It's not something you have to go, oh, the bubble, the bubble, the bubble, right? And like repeat it all the time. Once you've set that intention and set the intention for it to stay, it'll stay. I know I do um, prayers with my kids. And part of the prayer at the end is asking Archangel Michael to clear everything that does not belong to us fill us with this healing light and surround us with a shield of protection. And that's another way of teaching your kids, you know, doing something like that. And then also asking for it like, Oh, this morning when I got up, I forgot to, you know, do this, this, and this, right. And you can do it anytime throughout the day and always remember to ask. You can always ask for help, right? Hmm. Ask the angels or ask your spirit guide or um, ask your ancestors, you know, to help you out in those situations as well. Yeah. I've talked to so many people like yourself that actually had a lot of these, um, these senses um, that, that, you know, they could sense other beings or they could see stuff or um, they, they just had this knowing. And over the years, it went away because they shut it out because they didn't think it belonged. They, yeah. they didn't think it was supposed to happen. I did that um, too. And they, they, were, they thought it was wrong to be experiencing, you know, those, those senses, those experiences. And I do feel like people are starting to become a little bit more open to this sort of thing. And also um, I feel like it's important to be able to express that to the, the children because so many of these children, I mean, they're just wide open. They, they, they can just see stuff here or, you know, experience it. Um, obviously some are more gifted than others, but if we make it okay for them to do that when they're young, imagine if they, they have those, that skill set that they could build on from the very beginning. Um, you know, yours kind of reactivated during the car crash. Yes. Um, and, and most people's kind of reactivate because of some sort of trauma that occurs. Or you just wake up with it. I had a friend who just woke up being able to see auras in college. Oh, really? Out of the blue. Oh, wow. Yeah. For me, it was when I was little, I could see spirit, you know, wake up in the middle of the night and see a woman in white sitting next to my sister's head, you know, staring out the window in the moonlight, right? And oh, wow. And turn around and go, shh, or um, some not so nice things, you know, seeing, waking up and seeing a dark shadow next to my bed, which wasn't mm. so pleasant because we had a not so friendly thing in our house as well. But um, yeah, that there's you know, social acceptance, there's religious acceptance, there's, is this okay? Or, you know, start noticing other people don't see what you see, right? right? So then you're like, oh, am I not supposed to be seeing this? Or why am I seeing this? And nobody else is seeing this or being able to read people and thinking that every, everybody who's irritated and angry is angry with you, right? Because you're able to sense their emotion, like when either on people or even in houses and rooms, right? So it can be kind of uncomfortable. So I think a lot of kids end up tuning it down. It's really like right. a tuner on a dial, right? You can flip it on and off and you can turn it down or turn it up, right? right. And it's a natural thing too in puberty where a lot of people turn it down or it gets turned off because the hormones start going and then it clicks back on hmm. in early mid twenties, you know, that can happen as well. And then as we age, it also starts coming more online too. So age is wisdom is, you know, serious, right? Gotcha. Because okay. our intuition starts coming on more. We've not only got more experiences, but we're also experiencing more with all of our senses and our extrasensory senses as well as we get older. I know mine's coming on more now, like I'm um, a recent trip to Honolulu and going to um, uh, Pearl Harbor was oh, really- wow an interesting experience and working with clients and um, having them have had loved ones pass and having their loved ones join us, you know, during the session and be able to work with that in session has been um, a new kind of a new layer that's opening up in my work as well. So it does continue to come online and continue to kind of morph over the years as well. Yeah. And change. So tell me about um, Pearl Harbor that, I mean, can you, Tell me a little more about your experience and what you see and, and what you what you sense. 
Uh, I would imagine it, there'd it be a lot intense. going on there. It was, it was intense. So we had tried to go there um, a couple days before we left Oahu and we showed up too late for the tour. So, but um, when we were leaving, I noticed I was getting mental movies, mental images and pictures. And I'm like, huh, that's kind of interesting and kind of blew them off. Right. Because I really didn't have a context or really didn't put two and two together, I guess would be a better way to put it. Right. <laughs> so the next day when I went back, they started up again, as soon as I got in the general vicinity, right. <laughs> Within a couple of miles, they started again. And we went through um, the museum. I'm like, Oh, you know, that's what the mental images were. That's what the sounds were, you know, the sounds of planes and the sounds of gunfire and the sounds of people running and screaming and fire and smoke and um, smells. And then, um, you know, kind of let it drift off, you know, so I could really be in a learning experience as they were taking us through. So we go through and we get on the boat to head over to the memorial area, which is over top of one of the ships that sunk. And when it sunk, they weren't able to rescue everyone from the boat. There were still 4,000 men still stuck in the boat. So right. they built a memorial over top of this. And I noticed when I first got out there that my body language was starting to shift. You know, I'm looking over the boat and I'm noticing my hands are behind my back, right? And I'm like, huh, this is not something I normally do. So when I noticed that, I started tapping in a little bit to the energy about how I was feeling, maybe where that was coming from. So that was really, um, it's, I classify it as residual energy, right? You're tapping into the energy of what the men and women would have been like you know, during that time, right? How they would be standing at attention or, I see. or something like that, right? So you were almost uh, adopting the body language of that time period of the people that would have been there at that time. Yeah. And when I do my mediumship, I'm very much a physical medium. So I feel sense and kind, mm. of, kind okay. of can go into what they're feeling. I have to ask them to kind of step back. So I don't take on so much of it. Um, you know, during my training, when I do my classes, I've learned to kind of ask them to step back. So I'm not kind of going, going into all of their pain, but um, yeah. So I tapped into that aspect and then I started noticing the movies. I'm like, okay, there's, there's a spirit here, you know, that's kind of still hanging out. So mm -hmm. I said a little prayer and asked if, you know, there were still souls, you know, attached that, you know, this is what had happened and it was okay for them to move on, that their family was waiting for them on the other side. And I kind of just let it go and, you know, kind of refocused on, you know, learning and just be holding presence and being in the environment. It was really well done. It was beautiful. Um, it was, that was the USS Arizona. Is that right? Yeah. The Arizona, it was very heavy. Um, so then, you know, we took our pictures and um, said our prayers and stuff and got back on the boat. And I noticed on the boat back um, to the land, because you take a boat over to the memorial and a boat back, that we weren't alone. <laughs> so there is, you know, just a few of us that day. But I'm like, oh, there's a man, you know, sitting on the bench in front of me. And he's just kind of like sitting erect, you know, straight, staring straight ahead. And then there was someone else. And I heard him say, I'm going home. Right. And I'm like, wow. Wow. And I tried to process it. Right. Like, okay, is he going home? Like letting me know that he's walk crossing over and going home or have they been taking the boat thinking that they're going home? Right. right. And I started to get really emotional and noticed uh, as we're walking off the boat, we weren't alone. There were several men going through actually coming off the boat and taking the boat back to the land. Right. And I was thinking that this is just a loop that they go in a loop because they kind of faded as we exited off and kind of walked off onto the property. They kind of faded, which let me know that it's a loop right. you know, that they're going through, which was very disheartening and sad. And um, I tried to tell my friend that I was with, you know, what I had heard on the boat and I couldn't, I couldn't even get the words out, you know, that oh, I had right. heard just, it was, it was really emotional, very emotional. Yeah. There, there's a lot, lots, lots of residual energy and loops playing. Yeah. Lots of history, lots of imprints. Right. Now, can you actually help some of those spirits or 
ghosts or um, I don't know the proper terminology, but can you help them find their way so they don't get stuck on this endless loop? Yes, you can. You know, you can let them know what their situation was and what happened. And if they choose to, they can go into the light that their family is waiting and that they don't have to stay, that they can detach and move on, that there's more, you know, gotcha. in the life. Yeah. I actually like people who do that. You know, you see a lot of stuff on TV where they're going in and communicating, but there's not really a lot of follow-up. And I know Ghost Adventures and a couple other ones are starting to do a little bit more follow-up on helping these spirits cross over and, you know, kind of move yeah. on. Yeah. Which is yeah, I have a friend of mine who, uh, you know, claims to do that very, very thing. Um, she's like, well, whenever I, you know, bump into someone, I show them the light and most of the time I can get them to go. Me so uh, that's pretty neat. Yeah, it's good. I'm glad we can do that. Yeah. And I want to learn how to do that. that. Right. That there's, there's another side and that when we pass on, it just doesn't end that it continues on. I think it's kind of a good thing and helps a lot of people. I think, especially right now, you know, with all the death that's going on to know that there is an afterlife, that there's nothing to be afraid of. I think that's also nice. Right. Well, yeah. I'd love to hear a little bit about, um, so depending on the sense, depending on the way that you can pick up on the energies, each one of those is given a different name. Can you tell us what each one of those names are and, you know, what they would experience? Sure. So they mimic our five senses and okay. a lot of people talk about them from your sixth sense, which is functions out of the sixth chakra. And those are again, sight, feeling, hearing, taste and smell. And there's okay. also knowing. So clairvoyance is clear seeing, which you would see mental pictures, little mini movies, you can see things within yourself and your mind, like your imagination, like a daydream, right? And you, but there's also people who can see outwardly, like a person standing behind you or the angel standing in the room or something like that, right? Or the ghost, you know, that was in my room. Okay, right. <laughs> right? Um, there's clear audience, which is clear hearing. And okay. that's like hearing a voice um, or multiple voices. Gosh, there's been times when I've been drifting off to sleep and there's a couple people trying to like communicate with me. And I'm like, okay, not now. <laughs> right? Okay. The, the close sign is on. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, or I had a situation where I'm um, in 2017 um, before my life fell apart. I was coming home from a yoga meditation class across the West Seattle bridge. And you know how you go into auto driving, how you kind of just space out. Right. And I heard, are you ready? Right. <laughs> so then that, was, that perked me up because I had been waiting my whole life to hear again. Right. And I'm like, what? Am I ready? Okay. Yes, I'm ready. Right. <laughs> you get all excited. <laughs> right. And then reality hits and you're like, whoa, <laughs> you know, I don't Maybe know I wasn't I was quite so ready. <laughs> that's right? right. Maybe I should have asked for a little bit more information. <laughs> right? right. So I said, you know, when you hear something or see, definitely ask for more information. That's kind of a joke of mine now. Um, Claire sentience is clear feeling. So um, a lot of kids, a lot of people actually do this without knowing it. And the clairvoyance too, when they see a mental picture, right? And then something happens. But clairsentience is one of the more stronger skills in a lot of people. And that's okay. just um, feeling the heaviness in a room or feeling like, gosh, you know, this person may be a little upset or maybe you walk into a house and it feels like somebody just had an argument or something like that. Or you can actually get feelings off of people like um, their illness or... Um, like, oh, you know, when somebody's talking and they go, oh, my knee, I heard it, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden your knee starts hurting. That's mm -hmm. clairsentience. Gotcha. Right? When I'm doing my mediumship, I'll start feeling if they had stomach cancer, I'll start to feel it. Or if they got hit in the head, I'll start to feel it. Or back pain. And it's really like that uncomfortable back. You know, it's not yours. Right. So there's really a, um, with clairsentience, a differentiating between what's yours and what's not yours and really a skill that people should kind of hone. I know I've been working on it for years, like what's mine and what's not mine. Right. right? Um, Claire Gustance is uh, clear smelling. So you can smell things that aren't normally there. Um, my ex used to joke that I knew what people were cooking across the street before they started cooking it. Right. <laughs> because okay. 
<laughs> smell stuff. Um, I was at a retreat once and um, I was upstairs and I just smelled cigarette smoke. Right. I'm like, huh, that's odd. You know, I looked out the window, there's nobody outside smoking. Of course, nobody's smoking inside. It's a smoke free premises. Right. And I go down and I ask, and she's like, oh, that's my deceased father. You know, he used to smoke. And sometimes that's how he lets me know that he's around. Um, Let's see. Oh, and there's uh, Claire Cognizance, which is clear knowing, which is a strong one for me. And the more people I talk to, it seems that this is on for them. They might not realize that it's going on until they realize or have the awareness that it's going on. But it's um, sort of like, can be like a telepathy, right? You're tapping into what maybe somebody's thinking. So I have a a silly example I use all the time because I have four boys, right? (laughs) Like my child wants pizza and he's not sharing the fact that he wants pizza. And all of a sudden he comes up to me, you know, and I'm thinking pizza, gosh, it would be great to have some pizza. Right. And then he goes, mom, can I have some pizza? (laughs) (laughs) So it's just like really basic stuff. Like you're just picking up on stuff from your environment. Yeah. Is basically the, how the senses work. It's just like, if, our regular five senses, the way that we use those, they function in a lot of the same way. It's just pulling in for your body, your senses, you're pulling information from the environment. That way it works the same way. Yeah. Nice. Like mm-hmm. Yeah. I have, um, every once in a while I'll, I'll pick up on stuff, but, um, it, it's pretty few and far between. I, I definitely want to open up those doors a bit wider, but uh, I, I do hear stuff from time to time and, and messages and, um, Occasionally I'll see stuff and other times it's just like a, a kind of a knowing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, with, with no, n- no amount of accuracy really at all. Well, when I hear the, when I hear those messages, when those messages are clear, um, it, it, you know, it's kind of, it's a nail on the head. I mean, it really, it makes a difference. Like I, I, um, I'll, I'll follow up with it and it, that needed to happen. That message needed to come through and right. it's pretty impressive, but um, you know, it's not like I, j- I could just call on it. I could not make money doing that as my profession, I guess is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> and use it for your profession. Well, and- I bring but- in people of all sorts um, to, cause I, you know, I'm, the stuff helps people. Mm-hmm. Right? It does. Um, it can, but it can, can really lead you right down the right trail. And yeah. yeah. Um, so you're doing a, um, you're going to be teaching a intuition class. Is that I correct? Am. Yeah, I'm doing a summit in June and hopefully we'll have my um, course on intuition developed by then. And I talk about all this stuff in the course, you know, how to use Wonderful. it, where it comes from, um, why, what the clairs are, working with the aura and the chakras um, and use, making your better, you know, making your life better because of intuition, because you can use it in everyday life, right? Business owners like CEOs, I think are very intuitive because they know what to say and what to do and when to do it, right? Right. So if you own these skills, it's not just about, you know, being woo-woo or being psychic. It's about living your best life and using it as a skill, using it in your, you know, relationships in a healthy, positive way and using it, you know, with work and then to know what's the next best thing for you. You know, what's the next door, you know, you want to walk through what, what thing can you open up for yourself, you know, in your life to make your life better. Hmm. Yeah. Very well said. Thanks. Um, so I did have written down here uh, and chakra energy systems as it relates to the body. Ah. So I, I have been told that, um, if you're starting to get sick or starting to manifest disease, that uh, the seers can actually see that in your aura um, or in your energetics prior to it manifesting to a like a real physical, you know, uh, before it manifests in your body. Yes. So anything that starts popping up, um, like if you have a smoker, right, if I'm working on a smoker, I'll see brown clouds around the young's lungs, maybe some mucus and that sort of thing. If cancer is starting to develop in the body, it could start off as a brown shadow. And as it um, mutates, it turns into black, like black spots or Mm. like black dots, that sort of thing. 
Um, there can be rips and holes and tears in the auric field from different trauma. Um, we have seven major chakras in the body that start at the uh, tailbone, the perineum. That's the first chakra, seconds at the belly button, third at the stomach area, um, fourth at the heart, fifth, sixth, and seventh at the top, right? And any of those can be either shut down or immature or torn or have objects in them, depending on what we've experienced and what we've held on to, because the physical body really holds on to trauma if you don't know how to release it, right? And who's taught, you know, going through grade school or by our parents to release our trauma, right? Nobody. So it all gets stuck in our body and then can start mutating into different ailments like aches and pains or illnesses, right? Um, the shot, an interesting thing. I don't know if this is allowed or not, but I'm going to say people who are getting the shot there, I'm seeing in my clients who have had the shot brown clouds. And I was yeah. working with a woman last week and I can't clear it people get chemotherapy, there can be clouds and melting in the field. And it takes okay. a long time for the field to clear it a long time. Just watching to see how long it takes to clear. I know that it has changed the aura. I know it's not leaving the aura. And I'm kind of just watching to see how long it sticks around. Like it's, right. it's now, does it vary? Does that vary based on the type of shot? Or is it just the shots across the board? Shots across the board. I wonder why that's the case. Most of the people I've been working on um, have the two most popular ones. I'm not okay. going to say because <laughs> they'll enough. shut it down. But um, yes. Yeah. And then there's the third one, which is like older technology, I would guess. And I, mm -hmm. I mean, and I would be curious to see how they compare to, you know, like tetanus shots or... Right you know, just older shots that have been around for a, a long time and, and what that does. It's definitely different. And I'm not sure why, because when somebody um, does get a regular vax, it goes in and um, introduces it to the body and the immune system reacts, right? But this is actually like changing the field. I, I think that um, people in general want the best for humanity, right? But- yes. Um, sometimes we take the leap before we have all the information, kind of like missionaries who thought they were doing a great job by taking formula down to Africa, but didn't consider the water situation, right? And ended up with a lot of sick or dying babies. So I think that we have these, you know, good hearts and good intentions, but sometimes they, we don't think thoroughly, you know, about what we're doing. So it ends up going sideways. Well, um, is there anything else that you wanted to hit on? This is, this has been wonderful. You know, the indigo children and crystal children and that sort of stuff. Oh, you know what? That'd be great. I'd love to talk about anything in regards to the children. So when you say indigo child, what you're actually naming is the color in the aura. So that okay. is the primary color in the aura. So the, um, and the sixth chakra, which is your sight, your inner sight, inner outer psychic sight, right? Is indigo color. Okay. Right. So that would be the predominant color in the aura because that's how the person functions is from that predominant color. Right. Like if a person's really loving and compassionate, there's going to be like um, a rose pink color in the aura. If you're super creative, that's going to be an aqua color. If you um, are a teacher, um, you're going to have a lot of blue in your aura. Gotcha. So it does, it's not dependent on the age of the person. It's dependent on the, the, the gift or the sensitivity of the person. Yeah. Yeah. And there are definitely early pioneers with this, with the new ones that were coming on. I think that that color was probably in people's auras for centuries, right? It's just growing more. And I believe because we're evolving. So as we evolve, more chakra colors show up. As generations die off, some chakra colors die off, right? So like okay. probably cavemen were predominantly red to orange, right? Because the first and second chakras, um, the root chakras. survival, yeah, the root chakra, chakra survival, right. safety, uh, second chakra is personal power, right? So you would be very much in the caveman era, you know, right. around safety and survival, 
right? And then now we're getting into the upper chakras where we're more spiritual, but it's not about, I do want to add though, it's not about being outside of your body and seeking enlightenment out here because in this physical body, it's all about embodiment and being in physical form and um, reaching that conscious level physically, like from your physical self, from your embodied self. Mm. Right? Yeah. That's fantastic. I, I had no idea. I appreciate you clearing that up for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no problem. It's so what would that make my son? I guess, would, would he have a title? Um, I would have to look at him to see. I gotcha. I'm guessing yes, that he's probably a crystal child. Yeah. And they actually have full blown three dimensional crystals in their aura. Really? Actually, I'm picking up that he is. Yeah. If he's wide open. Yeah. So I would nurture that and talk to him about it and also have, um, I think that people in the spiritual community really need to start stepping into spiritual consent as well. You know, like when you have the TV show where a um, psychic is running up to somebody and they're spiritually bombing the person with, Hey, I, you know, have a message for you. Do you want it? (laughs) Right. Like that's um, I think that there needs to be consent, you know, around sharing information or consent around looking at a person's aura or consent around Hmm. Um, sending people energy. Now, when it's our children, you know, we have a contract with our children and our family members, right? We can send them energy. We can send them angels. We can send them healing, right? But I think with, you know, Joe Schmo walking down the street, right? We don't want to invade his personal space and kind of check out his aura or run up to him and say, hey, you have cancer or, you know, anything like that. Yeah. I think we have to definitely have some parameters around consent, you know, when it comes to healing work as well. Yeah. And that makes sense. And I've kind of heard that is that, that, that is a general rule that most people um, side with. Um, although when people have been in an accident, like if I drive by and someone's in an accident, I usually send a little energy to someone who's been in an accident. Yeah, me too. Um, the highest and so, best for everyone involved. Even the, yeah. the ambulance driving by, I say it and say a little prayer. Gotcha. That's very cool. I think that is okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. because you're offering up prayers. And I think the more prayers that can be opened up or, you know, healing intentions, the better. 